E seguimos com a programação da Arena Laranja com a sessão Inovação em Modelos de Negócio. Um tema indispensável para as empresas que buscam um diferencial competitivo capaz de resistir ao tempo e também às ondas de transformações tecnológicas. Vivemos uma época marcada por mudanças constantes nos padrões de consumo. Nesse contexto, criar novos produtos ou serviços é fundamental, mas nem sempre é o suficiente para se destacar da concorrência. Cada vez mais produtos e serviços podem ser observados, igualados e até mesmo copiados. Daí a importância de inovar em modelos de negócios, isto é, no conjunto de propostas e estratégias que orientam o funcionamento de uma empresa. Modelos de negócios muito rígidos podem criar resistências indesejáveis à mudança. Já os modelos de negócios inovadores vão na direção contrária. Eles estimulam a transformação do negócio, mudam os padrões de decisões, abrem caminhos de atuação e criam novas perspectivas de mercado. Nesta sessão, nós conheceremos alguns caminhos para a construção de modelos de negócios inovadores. Vamos descobrir como as empresas podem redesenhar suas estruturas internas sem deixar de administrar os riscos inevitáveis da transformação. Os debatedores serão Ahmad Tajuddin Ali, CEO do WAM Group Berhard, Felipe Monteiro, professor da INSEAD, e Samuel Borom, vice-presidente e diretor de marketing da Snap-on. Para começar, nós passamos a palavra a Luiz Melo, gerente executivo de tecnologia e inovação da Vale, que será o moderador deste debate. Boa tarde, Luiz. A palavra é sua. Boa tarde, todo mundo. Eu vou, a partir de agora, falar em inglês para nossos painelistas poderem acompanhar, já que do lado de cá, a gente não tem o headset para fazer a sessão. So I just uh, introduced that uh, we'll be speaking in English uh, for the time on. So innovation uh, in uh, uh, business models, of course, uh, it's uh, another set of innovation. Whenever we think about innovation, we conceive more of uh, technological innovation. But uh, uh, more and more, what we see is uh, that different business models uh, disrupt Uh, the landscape, uh, they change uh, how uh, different uh, societies and how different business uh, do things and, and produce uh, services and goods. Uh, for many of us here, innovations uh, and business models, uh, innovations would be the solution to maintain our uh, companies uh, doing business. For many others, uh, innovations in, in business models uh, will actually Uh, uh, just uh, end uh, our businesses. As uh, Andy Grove, uh, CEO from Intel, puts it, uh, there is no uh, disruptive technology. What uh, there is are uh, trivial technologies that uh, otherwise uh, just uh, 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 screw up your uh, business. Uh, there are been a number of uh, 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 strategies to experiment and to try new uh, business models. This is, of course, uh, very different if you're considering a company based in Malaysia as uh, OEM, uh, OEM uh, is, or a company based in the U.S. as Snap-on is, even though uh, with uh, uh, a global uh, presence. And, and of course, uh, we, we may also hear the experience uh, from European companies, as Filippi will, will mention us, uh, from uh, the uh, watch uh, uh, manufacturers in Switzerland. Uh, of course, whenever we conceive of uh, a new business, we must uh, think of our clients and, and who will be served by the goods or services uh, we are providing. Uh, new business models uh, are uh, ever-changing uh, in our society, and I think uh, this uh, 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 session this afternoon may help the audience uh, with uh, some thoughts on this. So, uh, uh, having this... Uh, Opening remarks, we we'll now hand uh, the uh, uh, session for uh, Sam to uh, move on, or actually to Ahmad to move on and, and mention the experience uh, from the Malaysian perspective. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. 
and uh, good afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank uh, CNI uh, for the invitation for me to speak. Uh, I know I come from a long way away. It took me 33 hours from door to door uh, to arrive here last night. But uh, I'm okay. It's only uh, now uh, 2 a.m. in Malaysia. So, uh, <coughs> by way of uh, introduction, uh, I am an engineer by training. Uh, previously, I've been uh, the CEO of uh, the Government uh, Research Institute uh, for Industry and uh, Standards. Uh, in the US, it would be the equivalent of NIST uh, and uh, NC, the American National Standards Institute, put together. But of course, ours is a very small organization. But then in uh, 1996, all of a sudden, we have a national blackout. And two days later, I was instructed by the Prime Minister then to take over the National Power Company. And uh, I was there for four years. And then uh, certain things else happened. I decided to, enough is enough, I went into private sector. And since then, I've been uh, here and there. And currently, I'm chairman of uh, the largest infrastructure group in Malaysia. We own highways. We are into real estates. We do uh, assets and facilities management of major infrastructure. So that keeps me busy. And uh, looking at the topic that is given to us today, I must congratulate uh, Brazil for the formation, or, or CNA for that matter, uh, for the introduction of this uh, mobilization of uh, entrepreneurs, the MEI, which I think is, uh, is a very nice um, uh, activity in order to get innovation, particularly at the enterprise level, going. And uh, along the same line, we in Malaysia started uh, way back 20 years ago, setting up a government industry partnership. And I'm here on their ticket, actually. The Malaysian Industry uh, Group for High Technology, short form MIGHT, M-I-G-H-T. And uh, it is a platform where industry and government uh, sit together, providing a platform in order to uh, encourage uh, industry to, to move up the value chain and, uh, and be more competitive, as it were. So, um, but finally, uh, I in the, usually say uh, the proof uh, of the pudding is in eating it. We can have all the platforms, we can have MITE in Malaysia or MEI here. Finally, it's about doing things to make it happen. And uh, on that score, as a country, Malaysia has been, in a way, uh, quite successful up to now. Uh, because we have moved from being, we, we became independent in 1957, and then we uh, move up from being an agriculture country into industrial development, uh, into uh, more knowledge-based uh, manufacturing and so on, but the challenge now is going forward. As nations becoming more competitive, neighbours and, and other competitors coming along, how are we doing? Uh, as a nation, you heard this morning, uh, the GII, the Global Innovation Index, Malaysia moved down from being number 35 to number 37. And when I looked at the details where we moved down, it is something that we are aware. And that is about talent, about uh, investment in R&D. And this is uh, what we uh, recognize in Malaysia uh, as uh, the biggest challenge, uh, especially on talent, on getting the right people with knowledge uh, and to move up the value chain, to be more competitive. Uh, the lack of interest among the youngsters today to take up science and engineering is worrying. It is not a Malaysian trend alone, it's a global trend. Uh, the uh, fact that uh, mobility today can work both ways. If you have a good environment uh, for attracting talent from overseas, they will come. But if the environment is no good, even your own talent will move out. So, and this is happening, we have a lot of uh, people, in a way, 
uh, seeking for better opportunities for their career and so on, going overseas uh, as opposed to uh, being at home. Uh, we do attract talent from some of the lower cost countries because uh, relativity wise, they are better off coming to Malaysia. But uh, our own Malaysians tend to see that maybe Australia or Canada or the UK or United States uh, offer them better opportunities. So as a nation, that's the challenge going, going uh, forward. At a firm level, I am, as mentioned, in charge of, a, uh, at the moment, chairman of an infrastructure group, a very old economy uh, business. But even that, that company, the, our company, is facing the challenges how to stay uh, well ahead of competitors. Uh, at the same time, I do hold other position. Uh, including the, being the chairman of the Construction Industry Development Board. Here is about innovate, uh, encouraging companies to move up uh, into IBS, the industrialized building systems, uh, to more higher productivity uh, uh, sector of the construction sector, which is tough. But this is where uh, competition is about. So I will stop at that. I think uh, my 10 minutes may be up. And then uh, we come back later uh, to move uh, from my perspective how uh, what we have done and what for me coming here also to learn uh, how others are doing, including Brazil. And uh, the lecture this morning is quite uh, uh, an eye opener in terms of the challenges of uh, small countries like Malaysia. We are one, I think, uh, uh, one twenty fifth the size of Brazil, and uh, we have a population of about 14% that of Brazil, a very small economy, but how to be competitive in this uh, current economic uh, uh, global landscape, what more into the future? Thank you. Thank you, Ahmad. Uh, Sam? Good afternoon. It's great to be in Brazil. It's my first time here. Thank you for uh, having me. and. Uh, I look forward to continuing to learn from all you. I think one of the key aspects of being interested in innovation is that you never stop learning. Whether you're at an established entity or a startup entity, I think uh, the day you stop learning is the day you stop innovating. So I uh, am very much looking forward to uh, continuing the dialogue with folks here and, and learning from you all. Uh, just to give you a little sense of my background, I, uh, I'm a bit of an odd duck as the expression is in the U.S., and that I've been in the uh, governmental sector, the uh, non-governmental organization sector, so uh, non-profits if you're in the U.S., and then uh, the for-profit side. And uh, one of the things that comes to mind immediately as I think about that time across, going across sectors, if I've learned nothing else, it's the, the, the expression or the uh, what some people call Miles Law, that where you stand depends upon where you sit. And uh, some of you may have heard that expression before, but most essentially, as you think about innovation in particular, always think about where people are coming from in that regard. Uh, I can think about literally one day I was working in municipal government on economic development, the next day I was in graduate school and business school. S I wasn't any uh, particularly smarter or dumber that next day, but I got treated differently by people because I suddenly was a business person instead of a, of a government person uh, without really having my actual knowledge having changed. But the perception of me had changed simply because of that shift in my role. So as you think about interacting with people in government, in the for-profit sector, and NGO sector, I just encourage you to try and take a step back and understand where they may be coming from and you're coming from. Uh, Snap-on Incorporated, where I currently work, is, uh, is uh, a provider and manufacturer and marketer of what we call productivity solutions, and that's really tools of all different kinds. So it could be hammers and screwdrivers and ratchets, uh, torque wrenches, but also software tools and uh, other kinds of diagnostic tools to help in the transportation arena, so automobiles and heavy duty trucks, could also be in mining, uh, alternative energy like the wind turbines, 
also um, aviation, and a number of other what we call critical industries around the world. In Latin America and in Brazil, I would say predominantly, it's mining, aviation, and the transportation uh, industry more broadly. And I'm happy to talk more about that later on if people are interested in that. Uh, I would offer you a, a few thoughts generally, and I guess I'm speaking more from a, a cultural and attitudinal standpoint as we think about business models. And I know we'll get into this more as, as I think you heard from some of the other speakers earlier this morning, innovation is anything but linear. In fact, it's very, very messy, as many of you know. It's not black and white. It often offends your senses and your sensibilities. And if you're not uncomfortable in some way with the innovation work you're doing, then probably you're not doing it well. And that's one of the hardest things to come to grips with, I think, if you're focused on innovation. It's part art and it's part science. And people always want to make it science and linear and black and white and understandable uh, with models and whatnot. And I think those tools are important when you're getting our arms around innovation. But you have to keep in mind the limitations of those models, especially if those models are built on the past and the current and not the future. So as you think about the art and science of innovation, I'd offer three thoughts. One is collaboration and how critical that is. So if you're thinking about across sectors like I was speaking to earlier, I think that's absolutely a key ingredient in innovation. But equally important is thinking across functions. Uh, as many of you have probably experienced, uh, and again, thinking about Miles Law of where you stand depends upon where you sit. If you're in engineering versus marketing versus market research versus any number of other functions in an organization, it's very easy to, to decide that you only want your function involved or maybe one or two other functions involved because you can be faster and more efficient and you speak the same language more. But the downside is you lose out on that broader mix of perspectives on an innovation project that you may be taking on. So collaboration across sectors and across functions, I would highly encourage. Second is being customer centric. And often this may seem obvious, but it's difficult to, I think you, one has to have discipline individually and the organization has to have discipline to stay customer centric because often the customer's perspective is not convenient to your point of view, or it, 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 it causes you to take actions that may slow down your launch or your refinements. And when you're in a business trying to be efficient and trying to get something out the door, it's the last thing often you want to deal with. But if you're really being honest with yourself, uh, you may need to adjust what your product is about or your business model is about if you're really gonna serve the customer well. So always keeping the customer's needs in mind, absolutely critical. Lastly, I would say to you, failure. Failure is something that we often don't deal well with in innovation. Uh, it's not something that I think any of our cultures want to focus on and some cultures struggle with it more than others because of the idea of losing, fa uh, losing face. But the reality is innovation involves failure. It involves trial and error. And one of the key things to think about as an organization, as a business model, as a culture is how do we deal with failure? Do we embrace it? Do we celebrate it? Do we learn from it? How do we grapple with failure? So I just throw that out as one additional thought to consider. And with that, I'll pass it on. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Felipe. Boa tarde. Uh, let me start by just thanking uh, CNI, May, and Sabri for organizing this wonderful conference. This is remarkable to be able to put together such an important uh, event. It's not only remarkable, but so important for Brazil to have something positive and I have a positive agenda, so I'm really delighted to be here. Uh, I'm Brazilian, 
um, from Rio, kind of 15 minutes from here. Um, I moved away from Brazil from kind of 15 years ago. Uh, now I live in Fontainebleau, which is kind of 40 minutes from Paris, uh, and I'm a professor at INSEAD. For those of you who were here this morning, Peter Diamandis asked you, how many of you were entrepreneurs? Let me ask you a different question. How many of you are not entrepreneurs? Can I see a show of hands? So I believe, and I think uh, I'm going to be talking to most of you who are not entrepreneurs, because I think when you think about business model and disruption and exponential, uh, it's very good if you are really starting a new company and if you are kind of coming up with a new idea. But for many of us, the situation is you're already working for a large corporation and you see all this disruption coming and what do you do? And I think I spent probably the last 15 years trying to understand how multinationals from different parts of the world, how do they figure out what are those emerging disruptive business models, disruptive technologies, and how do they access them? How do they learn about them? And more importantly, how do they bring inside those things that they're seeing, right? Those new business models. So let me just give you a sense in terms of what type of industries I've looked at. Uh, so many years ago, I looked really in uh, telecommunications, right? Telecommunication providers like kind of Vodafone in, or France Telecom or Deutsche Telekom or Telefonica here. And how they were going to Silicon Valley really to see, right? As they have to create new revenues because data or more, even before data, voice was no longer uh, important. How do they see those new business models? How do they come up with new ideas there? Uh, I also look at a lot of the pharma companies with all the revolution on biotech and how do they find out um, and bring them and connect with the biotech firms. And more recently, I've been looking, as Luis was saying, at the Swiss watch industry and how the Swiss and especially the luxury watch, how do they really embrace the connected watch and how do they bring this totally different technologies into what they do. So let me share with you some of the learnings that I got in this process with working with those companies in those sectors. Uh, I think for me the first big learning point is when we think about new business models, new technologies, and we think about Silicon Valley or Shenzhen or Boston or different parts of the world, I believe that today the problem is not accessing and learning about them. Okay? I think it takes some time and effort and resources to set up something in Silicon Valley and learn what's going on there. I don't think this is the major barrier or obstacle. So uh, the idea of accessing, the, the idea of learning about it, I think it is less of an issue. I think what is really the big issue is how do you bring inside and how do you transform the companies you're working for. So I typically kind of joke and say, you know, we talk a lot about external innovation and open innovation, and I really believe that what we should be looking at is the internal barriers to external innovation. So I believe that most of the barriers are inside the organization. And I think some you, you, you mentioned a couple of things I'd like to kind of build on, because you talk about kind of innovations, about creating this discomfort, and also, as you were saying, you know, there's things which you see in the customers that you don't feel comfortable. Uh, and I believe a lot of the challenges about accessing and integrating new business models is how do you deal with business models that are, I call dissonant, right? That they create some cognitive dissonance within the organization. And I believe the problem there is not really about understanding what's coming. It's really accepting, okay? And not fighting what kind of contradicts your business model. So, for example, when I look at the telecommunications, one example that you can think of is if for a telco, right? So if you think about Telefonica, um, the technology can be voice over IP, and you have very different business models for voice over IP. You can have the kind of old model of Vonage, you pay a subscription and you have a box. And you can have a business model like Skype, where you don't pay, it's right as a software, and the underlying technology is the same. The business model is very different. And how telecommunication companies embrace or do not embrace those technologies can be completely different because of the different underlying business model. And I believe that kind of 
understanding and acknowledging how difficult it is for us, not at the cognitive, the cognitive level of understanding the technology, but really being able to embrace uh, those kind of dissonant business models, I think is very important to uh, knowledge. And I think the, the final point I'd like to make in this first round is you can have a more pessimistic view and say, you know, big organizations are big elephants and they will die or, and it's just a matter of time. And I'd like to bring to you a more positive, optimistic view on this because from what the companies I worked with and what I saw is the role that managers can play in selling, first of all, understanding, but then selling internally those new business models and how managers can really make a difference. So I think the, for me, we talked earlier today about entrepreneurs. I think that we should be very encouraged and also kind of promote the corporate entrepreneurs, right? People within the large organizations who are going to understand, bring, and sell those ideas internally. So I think uh, on the one hand, I think it's beautiful to see, right? And I think yesterday we saw all a number of new companies coming up with new models, et cetera, et cetera. And I think they, this is very healthy and good for, for Brazil. But I think at the same time, we should look at, right, at the Valley and the Naturas and the Embraers and those large companies in Brazil who are doing a lot of interesting stuff and also encourage, promote the corporate entrepreneurs who can go, right, cross boundaries. And I, I was talking to, uh, Luis, because I think the expression in English for this type of manager is boundary spenders, people who spend boundaries. And I was asking him, how would you say this in Portuguese? And he said, you should call them bandeirantes, right? Because they, they go and also cross the boundaries and, and, and expand boundaries. But I think kind of going back to the large corporations, I think we should understand, yes, accessing different disruptive technologies is difficult, but it's more than access, right? It's bringing them back. Uh, and also understanding the very important role that corporate entrepreneurs have in not only seeing, but selling and promoting those new ideas. And, and then with them, I think the large companies can also be very innovative and can also be part of that and reinvent themselves and evolve. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Felipe. I want to thank, uh, it looks uh, clear to me, it's, and, and, and this was uh, present in all of your uh, uh, points, is uh, we're, uh, uh, very familiar with the successful and with the unsuccessful cases uh, of innovation. Uh, the unsuccessful uh, being either uh, uh, Xerox when uh, they did not realize what they had uh, in hand or, or Kodak, which is a more familiar to many people. Uh, Kodak uh, did uh, come up with the digital film and yet uh, did not uh, uh, acknowledge that or did not uh, see the value or the, the managers were not able to sell the idea to the company at large. And, and so we have a number of examples in which innovation uh, was uh, developed inside a large organization, and yet the organization uh, could not see uh, how to uh, uh, move on and, and to uh, incorporate that uh, inside a company. And yet, uh, uh, to the other side, uh, Epson, for instance, which was uh, well known uh, at uh, a given side of the market on uh, uh, making photocopies of uh, documents and, and was able to shift and, and to uh, both uh, have a strong uh, business in the inkjet uh, printing as well as on laser printing, which are uh, very uh, competitive in terms of their nature and yet uh, the company was able to, to incorporate uh, that uh, development inside a, a, a different uh, a structure, organizational structure. But so, with that, uh, I would like to uh, uh, go back to Ahmed and, and ask, uh, in which ways Malaysia and UEM uh, uh, are innovating in, in business models? And uh, can you give us examples, and more importantly, tell us about uh, failed attempts for innovating for both UEM and, and Malaysia? And because, of course, uh, both Malaysia and Brazil being developing nations, uh, we, we may share uh, a, a number of similarities which may be relevant for the current uh, audience. Thank you. Um, yes, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have been 
well, acknowledged uh, in some way as, as among the dragons of the East. Uh, but this is, I would say, up to now. Yeah? Uh, we have been uh, able to reduce uh, the poverty rate of the country uh, from somewhere in the 30 to 50 percent, depending whether it is uh, rural or urban, from that range in when we became independent way back in uh, 50 years ago now, uh, to now less than well, about 1 percent uh, by, by uh, uh, you know, uh, global definition uh, of, uh, of uh, poverty. Uh, so the poverty rate has, has come down. So in a way that has been successful, uh, we have moved up in terms of our uh, GDP and uh, over the last uh, 15 years, for example, uh, our, our uh, compounded uh, growth rate has been in uh, about 6 to 8 percent, uh, which is uh, commendable. Currently, it's standing about 4.5 percent uh, GDP uh, growth rate per annum. So, compared to many, many economies, that is very good. Yeah? But uh, uh, in the context of uh, where we are, uh, we, have, we have not uh, what we used to experience, double-digit growth. You know? uh, but uh, four and a half, five percent compared to one or two or even negative growth in many countries is still uh, commendable. But as I said, it's up to now. Going forward, to me as a nation, uh, the challenge is much bigger. As I mentioned earlier, one of it is talent. We know uh, that uh, the, uh, the need to have a higher level in terms of the need for the future economy with more innovation and knowledge intensive industries and so on, you need these higher level uh, workers as it were. Uh, so uh, that will be a, a, a major challenge and as I said, you know, the, the tendency of uh, global mobility of talent workers uh, will make uh, compound that uh, uh, problem uh, further. But uh, at least there is this realization. Uh, the government uh, uh, has uh, set up, um, uh, I mean, in fact, the Prime Minister himself is chairing a global science and uh, innovation advisory council where he chairs. Uh, some top, uh, I would say, thinkers around the world, uh, practitioners, uh, leaders, uh, sit uh, that we meet, uh, well, we meet annually, but we have uh, uh, inter-sessional uh, sessions uh, with uh, key players around the world to advise on, on, on particularly dealing with this challenge into the future. But I'd like to go from a national uh, level. You mentioned about my company, UEM. We are in the old economy. We built bridges, we built highways, we built airports, uh, and so on. And looking into the future, this also will be needed. This infrastructure will be needed. Some less, some, you know, uh, maybe uh, with uh, uh, autonomous vehicles, with uh, the way changing lifestyles of the future that people may not want to own cars, or with the coming of new technologies, a drone, and you, you look at... Uh, you know, uh, private uh, taxis that is going to be flying about. Maybe the, the need for the kind of structure that we have today will be uh, changing. Yeah? But it will still be there. People need to live in homes. People may not want to own homes because they want to have the flexibility of moving about. Yeah? They just want to have somewhere to stay. And, uh, you know, service apartments or things like that. But those will still be needed. Yeah? So the all infrastructure companies uh, will be there, but how this will be delivered will be different. Perhaps there will be more, uh, rather than in-situ uh, construction, there will be more modularized, factory fabricated, industrialized building system will, will come into place. So different nature of the, the delivery of that old economy products will still be there, but in a new way, in a more innovative so how firms, as a chairman of a, of a group, I need to take care that I will have enough money to pay uh, for the you know, workforce. Yeah? So I still need to maintain the current business in order that there is revenue that will come that will uh, enable me to sustain. While at the same time, bearing in mind that unless we innovate, we, we move up the value chain, 
we may be, we may lose to others. Because competition today, I'm not only competing in Malaysia, while well, I want to go abroad to win jobs outside, there's a Malaysian company building uh, 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 urban transportation system here in Sao Paulo, where we want our, 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 our uh, companies to go abroad, but we at the same time must not lose out to other companies coming to our own backyard to compete. So it is, it is we are part of that global uh, uh, arena, as it were. So it's for Malaysian firms, uh, in order to be competitive, we have to move up in terms of our technological capability, our own productivity, our own ability to build cheaper, more uh, value uh, products that customers will want, because we have to compete both in our own market, let alone if we want to go overseas in order to win jobs. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. And so the same uh, for you, Sam. Uh, in which ways uh, do you see uh, Snap-on uh, in, uh, is innovating in new business models? Are you moving to digital rather than physical tools? Uh, and, and, and can you tell us a, a little bit about uh, failed attempts uh, to innovate in, in those uh, 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 trials and, and how uh, and what you, you learned? Sure, so I would say we continue to innovate across our full uh, set of product categories. So uh, oftentimes people think, well, what more can you do with a hammer or a screwdriver to improve it? And believe it or not, there's always something. Uh, I'll give you one example. Uh, there's something called a striking pry bar. A lot of times you use that in heavy duty, when you're working on heavy duty vehicles, where it's a, it's a, a, a longer pry bar, it has a handle on it, and it has a crown on it, a metal crown on it that you can strike with a large hammer. A lot of times you, one, one worker will hold the striking pry bar while his coworker hits it with the hammer. And this is a good example where you have to get into the customer's work environment to see opportunities. Because if you ask workers about, about this, they wouldn't have told us about this. But if you watch them, we notice something called the wince factor. I don't know what the right word, how you would uh, translate that in word. Wince, you know, so the person was holding it and when the hammer was coming down, he was making a, a funny face, worried that his coworker was gonna hit his hand and not the pry bar. So I don't know what the right expression is for that. You, you're worried, right? You, and that's something, right? Somebody who's working on trucks isn't gonna tell you, uh, right? They're too proud to tell you that, but if you watch them, they're, they're kind of cringing just a little bit at that moment. That, that provided an idea, an opportunity to think about, well, how could we try and address that? And again, this isn't a breakthrough innovation, but this is a, a good example of incremental innovation, is we increase the size of the, the crown. So in other words, where your, hand, where your hand was on the pry bar, the part above it was expanded so that if the, the hammer slipped a little bit, it would slide off to the side and it wouldn't come down and hit the hand. Pretty simple, right? But that's innovation. Sometimes innovation isn't a dramatic breakthrough. It doesn't have to be a totally new business or new category. And so you think about something like hard tools like hammers and screwdrivers and pry bars, there's always still some new opportunity to bring innovation to it. Uh, now on the other end of the spectrum, uh, we have a, a number of our businesses are software-driven businesses, cloud-driven businesses. Uh, we in North America provide repair information. So uh, if you're working on a vehicle, let's say, that you're not as familiar with, uh, you, may, you may then look up to understand, well, what's the wiring diagram for this Mercedes? Or what is the, uh, if I want to, uh, if I want to replace uh, the clutch, let's say, on a Volkswagen, and I'm not familiar with it, this would give you the diagrams and the instructions. To do that, tips from other uh, people who've done these, this kind of work. Providing that information has allowed us to look at a, a, what I would call adjacent uh, categories, uh, nearby opportunities where we're already providing that, that software to businesses who are repairing cars and servicing cars there's also then the opportunity to provide software 
for them to help manage their shop, manage their business. And then next to that, there's an opportunity to help market to their customers, CRM software for their customers. So in what seems like an area that might be limited, there's always the opportunity to continue to expand on it. And I would tell you on the repair information side, uh, what we're seeing uh, is, you know, you, we've all heard this idea of big data. Big data, what does that really mean? Well, in our case, big data has been very, very powerful in the sense that we have all this repair information that we're collecting. Uh, and we can tap that repair information for uh, better solutions, uh, tips for people to repair vehicles that much faster. For example, we can tell you if somebody has certain symptoms with their, with their vehicle, certain signs of trouble with their vehicle, uh, what most likely is the part that's causing the problem? And we can show you with diagrams and whatnot, 80% of the time if they're having X problem, then Y part is, is the, uh, probably the problem. So it gets you to the solution faster. So that would be an example of some, some, different, uh, some different areas where we've innovated. Now, as far as where we've fallen short, where we failed, um, I'll give you two, two examples. First example, uh, much more simple, is we have something called a low-profile ratchet. And uh, ratchet, for those of you who don't know, is just for loosening and tightening fasteners. Uh, and one of the most difficult challenges when you're repairing uh, vehicles is accessibility, getting to fasteners that are in odd places. Because often companies design their engines and other parts to be manufactured. They don't always design them to be repaired. So that creates all sorts of wonderful opportunities for us because then we can create new tools to get to those funny places. So the low profile ratchet, and this comes back to the whole idea of being customer centric. When we were first looking at it, it was all about being thin enough, but the, the socket as well as the ratchet itself being thin enough, narrow enough to get into the tight space. Thank you. The problem was as that project went on, the engineers involved with it were more concerned about the strength of it. And, and if it's we're going to be more narrow, if it's going to be smaller, if it's going to be thinner, aren't people going to be worried about the strength of it? So then when it was launched and brought to market, the marketing messages were all related to strength. And the reality was, I mean, that product wasn't a failure, but it was the messaging was off target. And we realized the original insight, the original idea and what people wanted was something that had to do with accessibility that was low profile. So that's an example of where you might have the right idea, but you can get off center and away from the whole idea of being customer centric. I don't know if that answers your questions. Thank you. So Philippe, going on the same uh, line uh, from, from your perspective and with the industries uh, you, you worked, what, what uh, will you tell us? So let me tell you a story that is both the failure and the success in the same company. So you may know the Swiss watch called Tag Heuer. It is for those of us in Brazil, we may have a, a sentimental connection because it was kind of the, the sponsor of Ayrton Senna. So to me particularly when I was working with them, I went to the kind of CISO office and saw the Senna's helmet was well. But the story with them, the failure one was a few years ago, Tag Heuer recognized that a lot of the, there was a lot of demand for mobile phones with some kind of luxury added to it, right? So we know, some of us know the virtue. How do you create a premium a mobile phone? And they, right, taking advantage of the Swiss brand name, they decided to launch their own cell phone. What was the big failure was, at that time, they thought they could do that by themselves. So they were late, they launched, right, a Tag Heuer cell phone, but technologically speaking, it was completely outdated. So it was a flop. They, right, they sold some units, but not enough, and, and then the product was discontinued. So when all the connected watch uh, came, and, um, and actually for the Swiss, this was a, a very clear message because Apple was going to Switzerland, right? They were going to this little town in Switzerland called La Chaux-de-Fonds, and they were kind of 
really poaching talent from the Swiss watch industry to go to work for Apple. So the Swiss start getting really concerned. So to what extent uh, there will come, right? Apple is going to really put a lot of effort on this. And when they launched the Apple Watch, the big question for companies like Tag Heuer was, what do we do? Do we come up? And they had this bad experience with the cell phone of recognizing a new product, but at the same time, maybe not having the capabilities to do this internally. And they come up with a completely different kind of business model for it and a completely different approach to it. So what they did was they partnered with Google and Intel. So they, they quickly realized, we know how to do watches. We don't know how to do connected watches. So they went to Silicon Valley and say, who can do the microprocessor for us? Because the equivalent of the movement of a mechanical watch is really the microprocessor. So they partner with Intel. And at the same time, they say, but which kind of apps are we going to have? Because are we going to develop, and we're going to go to APFL or to ETH in, in Switzerland and develop our own apps? Or who's, who's developing the, the language? How are we going to do this? And they end up partnering with Google. So in Switzerland, it was a major issue. And I think going back to the challenges of big corporations, in this case, maybe backing also to the country challenge, is imagine if you are in a country that you have the reputation of manufacturing the best watches in the world. To what extent you reach out to another cluster and say, you know, yes, we are the best kind of country to develop and to manufacture movement watches, but for connected watches, really the center of gravity in terms of where the technology is, is not here. So they end up with that decision to go to Silicon Valley and partner with Google and Intel. It was really a kind of a changing paradigm for them because for the rest of the Swiss, they say, no, you are, you are traitors, you're going to, right, we don't need to go to Silicon Valley to do this. Um, but I think th this requires, uh, and, and I think I, I really like one point that you said earlier, Sam, of we tend to put a lot of emphasis when we think about innovation in terms of numbers, technologies, okay, and the technical aspect of innovation. And I think when I think about failure and success in a case like this, what comes to my mind is the very important role, not of the technology itself, right, but about the leadership and the vision, right, and the cultural aspect that you're saying to overcome some barriers and go and be able to access it. So if you, at the end of the day, the technology in that case was not a major barrier, I think, was and what enabled them to be successful in the second effort with the connected watch was really going a change of mindset. And this recognition, right, not being rigid and saying, no, we are the kings of the world, we do all the Swiss watches, we don't need to be open to what's happening in Silicon Valley, let's do everything in-house, but having this approach and having right the mechanism to do it. Let me also just say one final word about this, which for me is, is always encouraging. The, the CEO of Tiger Heuer is a gentleman called Jean-Claude Bivet. Uh, his last name is B-I-V-E-R. So for those of you who don't know him, just Google. Because what impressed me is this gentleman is more than six years old. He was one of the responsible for the reinvention of this watch industry during the quartz crisis 30 years ago. And is this gentleman of 63 years old who is revolutionizing the watch industry in Switzerland, okay? Uh, so I think this should be an, right, an encouraging message for many of us who are right, not the millennials of how right, the, it is much more on the, right, on the mindset, on the ability, on the leadership, on the inspiration of people, rather than just think, you know, it is, it is in the air, it's a technology, is something technical that's going to make a change. So I'm not kind of underestimating the importance of all the technical aspects of it, but I think in that dialogue that we tend to put a lot of emphasis on technology, I think it's very important for us. And I think I also understand my bias, right? I'm a professor in a business school, so the, the people I'm interacting with are typically kind of business leaders is the amazing role that people can make and also the amazing role also of right, not thinking only about the millennials, but a very seasonal executives of how do they change the mindsets, how they inspire people to, to change the mindsets. And I think this case really illustrates how one country, right, and how companies in one country can reach out to another cluster, work together, this collaboration that we were talking before. Thank you, Felipe. So actually, uh, what uh, was uh, brought uh, by m many of you, and, and uh, I, I think 
uh, more recently by, by Philippe, is this uh, topic of uh, cognitive dissonance, which is uh, an interesting concept. Uh, it is uh, uh, as w when you're going to buy a car and you haven't buy anyone, you haven't uh, bought any car yet. Actually, you, you look at many uh, different uh, manufacturers. You look at, uh, let's say, Volkswagen or Ford or Cherry or whatever. You look at many. After you purchase your car, you actually don't look at many ads. You don't want to know you did a bad hmm. business. So actually, after you purchase your car, you tend to look only to the ads of the manufacturer of the car you bought because you want to reinforce you did a good business. Th that's known uh, fact, it's a, a psychological uh, uh, concept. And, and it's the same, it's valid for smoking. Uh, one of the, of the most effective as aspects of uh, the uh, anti-tobacco uh, measures of, of printing uh, uh, ill people, disease on, on the back of uh, 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 tobacco, cigarettes, is actually you don't want to know that uh, you may get that. And, and that, that uh, may provide this uh, dissonance and may provide the uh, impetus for you to stop smoking. And, and as you're mentioning, innovation uh, as bringing something new must bring uh, uh, some of this dissonance as well. So I would like uh, to uh, go back to each of you to uh, address how much of psychology and how much of marketing aspects are uh, embedded into innovation and to make innovative uh, business models more effective. Thank you. I will answer that question rather obliquely, uh, maybe. But uh, uh, as a nation, um, small as maybe we are, uh, 30 million people, uh, uh, well, uh, one twenty-fifth the size of Brazil. <laughs> uh, but uh, we do have in the past uh, areas where we have been uh, able to differentiate. I uh, would mention that I mentioned earlier that we moved up the value chain. Uh, we have uh, moved from agriculture to resource base to industrial production and so on. Um, in that first part, we have been successful. Uh, rubber, most of you will know, maybe you do not know. The rubber that we grow actually was brought to Malaysia by uh, British uh, explorers, whatever. They came here, they came to Brazil. It's called Hivia Brasiliensis. Brought to Malaysia, a few plants planted in Malaysia that in the 60s and 70s became the number one crop. We are the world's producer of rubber. That makes into tires, you know, the natural rubber and so on. All through R&D and through our Rubber Research Institute that is able to uh, transform the rubber tree that you know, huge, into something that grows straight up to a certain height is all through genetic engineering, all, all science and uh, to improve the yield and so on, and then moving downstream to produce products. Of course, we were selling at that time bales of uh, natural rubber, but then later on we moved down into actually making products. Another non-indigenous crop that was brought to Malaysia is actually the oil palm. It's from West Africa. Today it is, again, apart from oil that we Petronas was able to take out from the ground, is this palm oil is a major economic uh, commodity, which came about again through science and technology, because we are able to uh, develop this crop into something that is more high yielding, more crop resistant, more weather resistance, all done through the researchers in our Palm Oil Research Institute. So s and has brought us to where we are to be uh, among the uh, top 25 competitive nations, so-called, uh, that now become 37. So, but we have been able to move up the value chain. Those are the success areas that we have done, but there are areas that we have failed. Uh, because uh, to me, moving down at this point is a bad omen for the future. And I, I mentioned earlier, yeah. but we did not produce the right ecosystem 
for some of the new technologies. The thumb drive that we now use as a, you know, was actually uh, invented by an inventor from Malaysia. But somehow we do not have the ecosystem for him to commercialize that. He went to Taiwan and, and started producing it. The same with Grab Taxi, the Uber, is, is a Malaysian, uh, is, is, is produced by, or is dreamed up by a, a Malaysian entrepreneur. Again, the, the, the ecosystem may not be uh, you know, conducive or whatever. He went to Singapore and it is, it is uh, acknowledged as a Singapore uh, you know, uh, product. But in actual fact, the inventor is Malaysian. So the nation must have the right ecosystem for this uh, uh, you know, new, new economy, uh, you know, startups and so on uh, to be able to be successful. So, it, realizing that uh, we have, um, well, again, uh, government, I hope, uh, you know, is a facilitator, is the enabler, uh, have realized this and uh, uh, through, I came here uh, partly to market uh, the event that we're going to hold in Malaysia. Uh, our equivalent of this event here uh, on November 28th to 30th, together with the Global Federation of Competitiveness Council, uh, GFCC, which is also part of the organizer here. Uh, we are, they, are, they are coming to Malaysia to have the annual uh, meeting of the GFCC, the Global Federation of Competitiveness Council. We are going to host that meeting, but we're going to have our own Global Innovation Summit, uh, themed uh, sustainability, the future of uh, uh, production, uh, the future of consumption, and the future of work uh, as, a, as a theme. Uh, and and uh, you're all invited to come to Malaysia to see maybe a rubber tree that you have not seen before, uh, that, that has been engineered to, be, to grow to a certain size, to a certain height, before it starts branching and so on, all through genetic engineering. We still have these uh, rubber uh, plantations, but we are no longer the number one producer of rubber because we, we have to move on. Our, one of the uh, uh, negative factors about Malaysia today is that we cannot go on to be, we are no more the low cost producer. Uh, we, uh, at the moment, uh, out of a workforce of about 15 million, uh, we have somewhere between two to three million foreign workers uh, coming mainly from uh, Vietnam, from Indonesia, from the Philippines, uh, from other countries nearby that they look to Malaysia to be where they can earn a little bit more than in their own country. So we have all our plantation, all our construction sites, without these foreign workers, they always shut down. So we need them as much as they need us. So, uh, but the future is about moving up this value chain and I think uh, uh, at a firm level to, uh, to innovate in order for you to stay ahead uh, of competition and all put together become where nations can compete because the competitiveness of nations finally depends on the industry and the, at the firm level. So that's the challenge. I don't know whether I answered your question, but I wanted to advertise our innovation summit in, uh, in November at the same time. Thank you, Ahmed. Sam? If you'll indulge me, I'd like to try a little experiment, an audience participation experiment. If we could turn up the house lights. I don't know if this will work or not, but I'll give it a quick try. Can we turn up the house lights? Turn on. Turn up. Yep. Yeah. Can you turn on the Ah, Thank you. So, and forgive me if my language is a little off here. I mean, this, we'll see if this works. but. If, if all of you, uh, do you, do you say kindergarten? Yeah. If you thought you were creative in your kindergarten, could you please stand? Just stand up if you thought you were creative in kindergarten. Remember way back then, you're drawing, you're painting. So does the question make sense? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Now, though, stay standing. 
please. Those of you who then, let's say in high school, thought you were creative, sit down. Or excuse me, stay standing if you were creative in high school. If you thought you were not creative in high school, sit down, please. Okay. And then how about in university, in college, in university? If you thought you were creative in college or university, stay standing. If not, sit down, please. Okay. And one last question. In your current role, in your current job, if you consider yourself creative, stay standing. If you, you're not creative, sit down. Okay, so congratulations to all of you who are standing, by the way. My question to everyone in the room is, why are you not all standing? What changed from before kindergarten, in some cases from kindergarten? In whatever function we're in, whatever uh, focus we may have in our companies, whether it's finance, engineering, marketing, you name it. I think we all bring creativity to the roles. You can sit down, thank you for standing. But I think you get the point. It's just a very, it comes back to your question about mindset, is that something is off in our cultures and in our education systems that says you are no longer creative. And we tend to narrow the definition to somebody who's in a creative function like that somehow art related or design related, uh, graphic design related. Um, and that's clearly one area of opportunity for improvement that I think we have to work on. It's not unique to Brazil, it's not unique to the US, I think it's uh, international and it's a challenge and as we think about the education systems and the professional training uh, systems that we, we do around the world. I think we all have to try and continue to nurture and encourage the creativity that leads to the type of innovation across all the functional areas and across business models. Thanks, Sam. Philippe? <clears throat> so let me go back to your point about cognitive dissonance. And you give an example of you buying a car and or the cigarette, and you don't want to see information that disconfirms what you believe. And I think a very classic experiment is also you ask people so if i ask you how many of you believe that the central bank is going to increase interest rates and let's say that kind of you say yes then i show you 50% of articles that say yes 50% of articles that say no and you see more articles that confirm what you said before okay very well established experiment you can do this with groups they also behave in so I think the first thing, how do you do, and your question was, to what extent innovation is about mindset, is about psychology, is about... I think the first thing, when we know about those biases, the first thing we should know is acknowledge them. Okay. It's, it's our human nature to have those biases. Uh, and I think the first thing we should be aware is if you are mindful, you say, you know, I am more likely to reject things that are gonna contradict what I believe. I, right, you start to calibrate and try to create Mechanism say, you know, how, am I really seeing what I should be seeing or I'm only seeing what I want to see? Okay, so I think the, the first point to me is really on understanding that this happens, acknowledging it and trying to, right? There's nothing you can do, not, it's human, okay? You have those biases. So it's trying to, to think about ways of overcoming it. I think the second question, to me, I mean, a related question to me, and I'll go back to our morning discussion. I mean, I, f I think, uh, um, right, Peter Diamond's presentation was superb. But there's one thing there which I also think is important that we at least question and reflect about. So to what extent innovation will really be those robots and artificial intelligence, and what's the, what's the role of humans, right? And what's the role of managers and top managers and executives and leaders? And I'm convinced, uh, Luis, that uh, a lot of innovation, it is about inspiration, it is about kind of mobilizing, it's about kind of inspiring people to do what they, they have to do. So as much as robots and artificial intelligence and data analytics and IoT and all those things are gonna be very important and we should embrace them, I think that a lot of innovation, so I think the word you used was psychology, 
And I think my way of kind of another label would be is human. Uh, and I think that, that that humanity in innovation, I think is precious. I think we should treasure it. I think leaders should not kind of shy away of it. I think the impact of leaders in making innovation happen, mobilize organizations to change. So, right, you can take himself, right, or you take Elon Musk and you, you name it. Okay, part of it is the technology behind it, part of it is psychology or leadership, right, is ability to make, to see what people would really motivate people intrinsically to change the world. And I think your experiment of asking what people, why they are less creative today than were in kindergarten, I think it's very interesting to see how easy it is for us, okay, to end, end up in a circle of just reinforcing what we know and getting better and better in the same thing and our ability right to challenge our assumptions to challenge what we've been doing and to reinvent ourselves uh, i think it's not easy but i think it, it is what we should be aspiring to uh, and i think as i look at the future and as I look at the future in brazil as well i think one thing that brazilians are very good okay is really on the creative part on the human part and i think we should kind of not kind of underestimate how important it is, okay? Because if you may have the best technology in the world. If you don't have that human component, I think you don't, you won't go that far. So, um, so I think it's as many things in life, right? So the, the typical uh, challenge is how do you balance those things? And how do you mix those things? Uh, but I think we should kind of be aware and, sh and should acknowledge the importance of both, right? It's both the AI, and IoT and all those new technologies, but also of people like you, okay, that can really make a difference in organizations and how they innovate. And a lot of it for me is really the psychology, the inspiration. Sam? Can, I was, yeah, just offer a build to that. I uh, couldn't agree with you more. You know, as we think about business models, I think one thing we should consider is the education models we currently have. and. Uh, with all due respect to my academic colleagues up here, and obviously you have your own views on this, if you think about our education systems, this is definitely true in the United States, and I know it's true in a lot of other countries. I'm no expert on the Brazilian education system, but if you think about the systems, they were set up a cent uh, more than a century ago. And, and while there have been experiments at the margins to change them, and, and I think successful experiments on, in a number of places, this, the, the systems as a whole have not evolved to address current times, let alone future times. And so whether you're thinking about the four-year college experience or advanced degrees, or whether we're talking about uh, what I would call, in the US we'd call skilled workers, which would be people who get uh, training beyond high school, but not necessarily a four-year degree. Uh, so, so that could be an automotive mechanic, aviation technician, uh, someone who's working on uh, computer-controlled uh, systems in a manufacturing environment. Uh, the upskilling of the workforce, uh, I think, in all of our countries, uh, and I know it, it, particularly in the US, is a big, big issue. And when you think about places where we're failing or falling short, I think that's a very critical one. And so both from a technological knowledge standpoint and from a sort of a attitude, cultural standpoint, I think we are failing ourselves on that front. And yes, there are some examples where we're, we're trying to do it and we've made progress, but we're not nearly filling the gap. So for example, quick quick example or a quick number, there's uh, expected to be and already is six million jobs in manufacturing alone in the US that are going unfilled uh, in the next few years. Uh, we aren't producing nearly enough people uh, or upskilling enough of the current workforce to fill those jobs. That's gonna, wreak economic havoc uh, in the U.S. And unfortunately, I think that same, there's that same challenge across the world. Uh, I would like to go back to this point of uh, education and, and bringing one aspect which is uh, not uh, that much uh, well known, I, I think, uh, from our perspective in Brazil. Uh, of course, uh, 
we all know that uh, we, we fail in a number of aspects uh, in the Brazilian educational system, but there is this uh, one fact which is uh, not uh, uh, that uh, frequently mentioned, which is the uh, rate, the illiteracy rate in Brazil. And that is currently uh, about 8%. So 92% of the population has some reading uh, skills, but still 8% does not have it. Uh, the figures that the US had for 8% illiteracy are from 1910. So actually Brazil in that way, it's over 100 years behind the US in terms of illiteracy rates or in increasing its uh, uh, skills. And, and I would like to uh, uh, then uh, go back to you and, and, and ask how much, of course, anyone may innovate. Uh, it, 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 it's, re let's say, regardless of uh, a formal education. But of course, a formal education seems uh, much more conductive for being innovative. So I'd like, we have about uh, 10 minutes to, to finish our session. I would like you, each of you to, to expand on this. Ahmed? Yeah, um, again, uh, our own experience, uh, we have been able to uh, give uh, education more or less across the board. I think our, our literacy rate has gone down uh, illiteracy rate uh, down to way, way in the low single digit, 3%, eh? yeah, 3%. So uh, uh, that, that again has been uh, successful. Uh, education is free until uh, upper secondary. So, and, and being a small country, maybe accessibility to good uh, education system is uh, maybe easier and compared to Brazil being a much, much bigger uh, expanse of the country. Uh, but uh, that, that to me is one of the competitive uh, weapon for the future. And as I mentioned at the moment, uh, in our case, uh, maybe we're not alone, but uh, the lack of interest in uh, what we call the STEM education, science, technology, engineering, uh, some, some people say not engineering, uh, E is not engineering, E is English uh, and mathematics because uh, the focus on, on, on learning of English uh, is, is, uh, has gone down uh, from when we were under the British, uh, but then now the effort is to bring it up such that the uh, command of English uh, uh, by the young, uh, among the young is, is much better. But uh, the one that I would like to maybe add, uh, what we are trying to do for the future, uh, uh, there is this national aspiration under the previous Prime Minister, two Prime Ministers ago, he had what we call Vision 2020. Uh, and there were certain uh, targets that were put this way, way back in the 80s when he started Vision 2020. Now 2020 is only two years, three years ahead. So we are almost there. The current Prime Minister has, uh, has uh, come up with a new movement. This is not his now. He's making a people's movement, uh, TN50. Uh, Transformation National uh, 2050. Uh, the target is uh, to increase our, our um, you know, uh, GNI per capita, uh, currently standing at, uh, uh, in current, uh, at about 10,000 US dollars uh, per capita. Uh, the target is to move it to 15, but uh, th this was intended to be 2025. Uh, and then, uh, 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 at the same time, uh, uh, we have other uh, moves uh, in order to uh, enhance the competitive position uh, of the nation. The target is to have by 2050 to be among the top 20, top 20 as a target, uh, competitive uh, from a competitiveness uh, 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 ranking. Uh, and and this, this is something which I think there must be that aspiration by the whole nation, embraced by everybody, that, uh, that that's where we, we are heading, and, and to do all those things that is necessary uh, in order to enable to move up that ladder. And one of the key points that I've always been saying uh, in my previous capacity as uh, President of the Academy of Sciences Malaysia, which I finished my term at the end of last year, because by law, it's only 
two terms of three years. So I finished that. One of the greatest effort that we are trying to do is uh, to, to ensure the uh, stress or the importance of uh, education uh, from primary, from even lower, for them to be more interested in the STEM subject that I mentioned, uh, science, technology, engineering, uh, mathematics especially, uh, in, in order to prepare the necessary knowledge-based workforce of the future. Well, a, a couple thoughts I'd share. I think one of the challenges we have in North America is that <clears throat> we've gotten too focused on the idea of and the drumbeat of going to a four-year institution, you're getting a college degree. And in the course of focusing on that, I'll, I'll give you an example. You know, one of the things that people quote is, well, if you go to college, average lifetime earnings, you know, are over a million dollars, you can't have a better life than that. Well, the problem is uh, that's an average. So that average includes people who are making some pretty big money on Wall Street, uh, in Silicon Valley, uh, and it doesn't reflect the reality of, the, uh, of a lot of the people who go to a four-year institution and take on all that debt in the U.S., which is a whole other challenge. So for example, if you start to split the, uh, split the um, income of people who go to four-year institution, if you look at the bottom 25%, this is in the United States, the New York Federal Reserve looked at this, if you look at the bottom 25%, they earn no more than somebody that graduated from high school. And uh, that, so they've spent that time, they've taken on that debt, and they're earning no more if they'd, they'd been better off not going, obviously. Now, I, th I think we're starting to see that shift in the United States where there's not one golden path, that in fact there are many paths that people can take and one can get, uh, one can earn and obtain a middle class living and have a very respectable job uh, by not going to college. They can go to a trade school, they can go to a community college, they can get uh, certifications, it doesn't have to be a degree, and uh, become automotive mechanic, aviation technician, a number of other jobs that pay very, very well. Uh, and jobs that pay more than a lot of uh, uh, four-year degree jobs will pay, especially if you start to split out the different opportunities. So part of this is the message, the PR problem, if you will, of, of helping people understand what the pathways are and recognizing those as being equally successful, equally respectable. Uh, part of the problem in the U.S. is we've gotten a little off, I think, in thinking that you have to be a, a YouTube celebrity or a newscaster or president uh, in order to have uh, achieve success. And I think that's our notion of success we've gotten off, tra off track with. Success is about being able to keep your family warm and safe and dry and have a respectful, respected and uh, a job that you have dignity uh, around. And uh, so I think if we can adjust that back to what it was, I think that uh, will help us in the future with uh, a lot of the upscaling challenges that we have. And uh, I know in Brazil, obviously, the, it's, it's very impressive what's happened with the middle class in Brazil. Uh, and I think the challenge is if we're going to sustain that middle class, uh, you need to think broadly about the, the pathways in education and the pathways of careers. So uh, let me, I'd like to offer maybe a complementary view on what my, my fellow panelists mentioned. So in the last 15 years, uh, I worked for some of the kind of best universities in the world. So I was at Harvard, then the London Business School, at Water, now at MNCAD. And you may think, what is the challenge when you think about education really when you are in a, some of the kind of the top level universities in the world? And let me share with you what I believe are some of those challenges, which are really big ones. 
I think the first one is if we're going to be 100 years, right? we're going to live for 100 years, uh, maybe 30 years ago, 40 years ago, it was enough for you to say, no, I have an MBA for INSEAD or from Harvard, and that's going to be your main education, and th that's it. It is clear that this is no longer true. So how do you have this continuous learning, continuous education, how you're going to reinvent and, and keep educating leaders, uh, which requires a, a very different approach. So it is really on the top of our agenda, uh, how do we do this? I think the second challenge is also connected to this, which is how do we embrace and to what extent we embrace all the new technology in terms of delivery? So are we going to go and really, to what extent, presential learning and really have face-to-face vis-a-vis having kind of online and virtual reality and right augmented reality in education is going to change the scenario. Uh, I think so far for us, we've been investing a lot of time on developing kind of custom-made hybrid programs. So working with organizations, we have done kind of major programs, for example, for Microsoft and others on this. Uh, but it's clear, right, as you think about education in the future, what is going to be the role of online, and not only online as a substitute, but as a complement to face-to-face -face, uh, education. And I think the third one, which I also believe is not a minor one, is as you see all the transformations in the world, okay, and all the big challenges from, right, climate change to sustainability and poverty and, right, how we are as educators, right, and as educators in terms of educating business leaders, what is the role of those universities informing people not only on the technologies, on the business skills, but are we really forming leaders who are going to really be able to tackle those multidisciplinary, multi-stake type of challenges? Uh, so uh, I'm just sharing this with you to give some light on, to shed some light on, because we have kind of problems and challenges, right, at the very basic education, at the professional education. And I think it's also interesting from where I stand, which is as you look at kind of some of the universities which are really resource rich and we are very privileged to attract some of the brightest minds, is also there's a lot of challenges for institutions like ours. And, and I believe, okay, that it's really important that we don't shy away from addressing the big ones and just addressing the kind of the more mundane ones. I have to stop for sure. one build if I can. I think the other challenge is bigger companies, our company or certainly much bigger companies than ours, are able to train their own. Worst case, we can, we can bring people in and train people to be in the jobs that we have. I think the more important issue is for, for each of our economies and our societies is, as we know, small and medium-sized businesses are really where the growth uh, takes place and really where the new jobs are created. Small and medium-sized businesses aren't in a position to train their own. And so as we think about this challenge, I think we have to keep in mind uh, the different types of companies. Because sometimes uh, someone can, somebody could accuse a bigger company of just saying, well, you're just trying to get free training for your associates. And, of course, we want a better trained workforce. Everybody does. But the reality is we could train our own at the end of the day. But uh, small and medium-sized businesses cannot. So if we really want to feed our economies, we've got to think about that upscaling challenge in new ways. Ahmad, you want to uh, Sam, I want to take on what you said earlier about at the end of the day, what it's, it's all about. It's about a man being able to look after his family, you know, feed their family, save, have a home, able to work. But to me, even on top of that, is to be able to have an enjoyable life. Yeah? Uh, you know, it need not be very high paying, but at least he's able to meet all those and have this uh, fulfillment in terms of uh, satisfaction. Now, in, in that context, when I, uh, you know, in, in my capacity that I've been uh, sort of soldiering on uh, all these years, uh, in Malaysia, it is about back to education. It is about the challenge of uh, education uh, for everybody, for the young, for everybody, such that the level of literacy and education, as it were, of the general population is higher. And I would put another 
condition to that, to say that the more scientifically literate the general population is, the better they are to be able to enjoy the life in the future. Because the life in the future, even now, today, uh, everything in the house now is technology-based. Uh, whether it is a DVD or the uh, television and, and so on, very, you know, you pay a lot for it, but some, many people do not even know how to use uh, to program, to record a, few, a program in the future and so on. But this, this is something that is going to be part of life. So the more technology li technologically literate the po general population is, the better they will be able to enjoy. The challenge is, how do we get the current education system to deliver that? The challenge is, how do we get teachers to be able to teach to the younger ones who expect to be taught in a way that they, they, they enjoy, they like, when the teachers themselves were trained in the old technology, as it were. So that is, to me, the challenge that our education system is facing, and uh, is how to teach science, technology, mathematics to the young ones in a way that they enjoy, that they will want to learn. It goes go back to the retraining of teachers to be able to reach to the youngsters in a way that will make learning enjoyable. And I think that challenge is worldwide. Let me just build on this, just to remind ourselves also why we're here, right? Because this is a, a congress that is kind of organized by the right, small and medium enterprise association Brazil. So really on your point about the, the need to reach out to the small and uh, companies. But also, I think when you think about how do you teach in a way that the young people would really benefit from it and would enjoy, I think it's also very important that we all hear right, that a, a venue like this, right, of, of a forum like this is able to connect, right? Academia, business leaders, kind of public sector, small firms, large firms, because I think to me the solution doesn't reside in any of us in isolation. It is really on that dialogue and on that communication that I think we're gonna make progress. And I think the second one is, in a world that we see today, right? So much of kind of isolationism and protectionism and kind of and closure, I think it's very refreshing, right, to be here and to be here with such a kind of an, an international kind of crowd, really trying to learn from each other and try to share. So I think it's, it's both the learning across sectors of society, small, large, academia, public, private, and also learning across the world. And, uh, and I think this is really important. I think the, the next step will be, in my mind, kind of a result of that combination rather than any nation or any sector in isolation. And one thing that uh, is clear from uh, what uh, was mentioned, and we have about eight minutes, uh, we're giving a little bit more time. Uh, maybe the session is good, or maybe we went uh, well on the time. Uh, and, and there is this uh, uh, aspect uh, that Sam brought, which has to do with uh, as we age, we lose uh, our creativity. And, and that actually comes, uh, uh, or should come, uh, in conjunction with uh, becoming more effective at what we do. Actually, as, as we uh, learn any language we, we, uh, from, from uh, birth, we, we become more proficient at that language, and in the same uh, uh, way, we, we lose capacity of uh, uh, spelling some specific phonemes of uh, different languages. So uh, actually, that's uh, built in in our brains in, in how we learn and, and with that, actually, how we innovate. Uh, as, again, was uh, mentioned here, uh, when we're discussing innovation in uh, business models, there are a number of aspects uh, which uh, uh, are to be considered, and, and as mentioned, uh, education is one of them, uh, uh, the national uh, aspects of uh, uh, different uh, uh, countries uh, is another uh, aspect. And, but it, it wasn't uh, mentioned uh, uh, much or discussed much, and we still would have some time, uh, whether or not uh, it would matter whether you're in the construction sector or in the uh, tool manufacturing or manufacturing uh, sector, uh, the, let's say the service sector. And so within the time uh, we have, I would like each of you to uh, expand on, on this, on, on uh, 
what differences do you see in innovation in business models for uh, manufacturing, I mean, manufacturing, construction, and service, let's say? For me, as I, I mentioned earlier, at my, uh, my firm and in the sector that we operate, uh, looking into the intermediate, short, intermediate, and maybe a little bit into the future, that work, that uh, service needs still to be delivered. Homes need to be built, infrastructure need to be built, airports, bridges, and so on. Yeah? But it is how we deliver that. Uh, because there will be new technologies, there will be new expectation of the customer, uh, especially in homes. Uh, they, they, they want quality, they want the, at the lowest possible price, and so on and so forth. Is how firms has got to, uh, will have to innovate in order to be able to the uh, expectation uh, of the customer and the need of society. Uh, so it is about incremental innovation, using technologies that's available, uh, but at the end of the day, to be able to do more with less. Uh, in other words, in the case of construction, the use of heavy equipment, robots even, to do some of the more menial work rather than uh, workers uh, doing, you know, the, the, the uh, for these, they call it uh, dirty, dangerous, difficult, and whatever the other the, uh, work, rather uh, than be done by men, perhaps it could be done by machine. Rather than doing on site, it could be done in the factory, where there's more control environment for production of better quality, as well as better environment for work of the worker. These are incremental innovation at the firm level that needs to be there in order to deliver what is, would still be the old economy products. Thank you, Ahmed. Sam? Uh, I, I guess the answer is both. It's a balance, as, uh, as I think has been spoken to. Certainly, ideas like collaboration, uh, mindsets around failure, um, creativity, uh, being customer-centric, those cut across, I think, industries and sectors, no question about it. So there's, a, there's a, an art and a science to innovation that certainly is shared and cuts across. Uh, but there also is clearly expertise and knowledge and know-how within a given industry uh, that, you, that, that is uh, more unique to that particular industry or sector. So I think that uh, if you take the example of, of again, being customer-centric, um, in a place like Snap-on, uh, there's a lot of in-house knowledge around the experience of our customers as it relates to working on vehicles. That's not something that necessarily translates imme immediately to another, another sector. Um, but uh, I think one thing we've found is that you need to adjust to where that industry is, where that country is uh, in, its, in its particular growth. So for example, uh, Ideas around safety and ideas around efficiency might be very different uh, in, let's say, mining in Peru than they might be uh, in aviation in China. And so I think part of what you have to adjust for is, you know, again, this is all about being customer centric. Where, where is your customer at that point? What can you do to be most helpful to them? to be value added. So we find that we adjust and bring different ideas from different parts of the world to share with other customers depending on where that industry or customer is in that particular environment. Does that make sense? So uh, I think quickly, uh, first of all, I couldn't agree more with some when you said that there are a number of features which cut across sectors. And I think to my mind, there are many things that we don't need to reinvent the wheel. There's much more to learn than than differences. But maybe there's one interesting aspect uh, that we haven't talked about in the discussion about sectors, which is really how do you redefine which industry you are, okay? Because sometimes part of the challenge might be, I think I am, and I think we saw in the morning, so I think I am in the paper and chemicals and actually I'm kind of in saving memory. And I think for us, right, if you think about services, institutions like INSEAD, are we in education at the same time, right? Is, is education, is knowledge creation, right, is really, so that understanding of exactly which industry you are and how this industry, how this sector, in the way you said it, is being reshaped may also 
kind of pose new opportunities and challenges and how do you see innovation in the sector? And I think, I think what is fascinating in many sectors is how the mere definition of those industries are completely changing now, which will require kind of much more flexibility and, and much more. So I know we're running out of time, but maybe one way of seeing this too, and at least to me, makes a lot of sense is how humble we should be and, and how kind of hungry we should be to kind of never be in our comfort zone, okay? And be humble not to believe we are, right, the largest one, the best one, and we, we have right mastered it because sectors are changing so much, and I think our willingness and, and our kind of commitment to learn, to be humble, and to work together, I think is very important. Thank you. So with that, I uh, would like to thank the panel for engaging discussion, interesting uh, points that were brought. would like also to thank the audience uh, for uh, being here and, and participating with uh, <laughs> engagement uh, as well. And uh, please enjoy the remainder of the Congress. Thank you all. <laughs>